And we're back. So you've had a few minutes to think about what the consequences are for your flow transparency. Any guesses? Well, maybe something will uh, be inspired by this very simple model. So let us finally uh, stop babbling and look just a little bit at a simple model. So let us, uh, as usual, take this uh, stance that we have one asset with fundamental value V, which can be either high or low with equal probability. So the mean value, the market valuation of the asset um, who does not know the true value is given by VH plus VL over 2. Now we have dealers in the market. Now let's say there are at least two. It does not really matter uh, if there are more. So we have one guess uh, in chat on the consequences of order flow, which is higher price impact of big orders. I don't think our simple model will capture that. But in general, this seems uh, probably right. I guess you did not say, yeah, the effect of order flow transparency, not opacity. So with transparency, higher price impact of big orders um, may or may not be a thing. It depends on, well, yeah, no, no, sorry, yeah. Yeah, that sounds right, that sounds right. It's very, very intuitive. So if, if you don't know what, um, Yeah, I guess it's what we did last week in, in previous lecture. That's what we saw there. We had a greater depth in the Kyle model, and that would be exactly that. So yeah, 10 points Gryffindor. But we'll come up with another consequence. And uh, in, a, in a simpler, in a much simpler model. So this will be closer to Gloucester and Milgram. So we have at least a couple of dealers who said, quotes, dealers are as usual competitive and risk neutral. Uh, yeah, and we have two traders, or it would be more correctly to say that there are two orders, orders in the market, and these two orders arrive simultaneously. So you can think that this is uh, one trader submitting two different orders, because what will happen is, with probability pi, both of these traders, both of these orders will come from informed traders, so from someone who knows the true V. And uh, so both orders will be for one unit of the asset. While with probability 1 minus pi, we'll say that both of these orders are coming from uninformed traders, from liquidity traders. And in this case, we will assume that these are two different liquidity traders, and in particular, one of them is willing to buy, and one of them is willing to sell. So the big idea here is that we will have higher correlation of the order flow when traders are informed, right? Because when um, trader is informed, if VH, then both market orders will be to buy the asset, if V is low, both orders will be to sell the asset. While orders coming from liquidity traders are less correlated with, uh, with, with the true value of the asset, so they will be less correlated with one another as a consequence. And we model this in a very, very cheaty and dishonest way. But what I can tell you is that if you model this slightly more honestly, say that each trader is informed or uninformed with probability pi, and liquidity traders buy or sell with equal probability, so their orders are not actually correlated negatively with one another, you will get the very same conclusion. It will just be slightly less uh, visible, slightly less salient. But to illustrate the point, we'll stick with this uh, less realistic model. And we will do the following. So if market is opaque, 
Oh, we have a, another question in chat. I was wondering why the book doesn't consider the case where one is informed and one is liquidity trader. So that's exactly that, exactly what I was talking about. Uh, it, you can consider that model, you will get the same conclusion, it will just be slightly more, just a little bit more of a pain to analyze. It will not be really difficult, and I'm considering maybe giving you that as an exam, although this will not be a very insightful problem, exactly because of uh, what I'm telling you just now, because it will give the same conclusions that we have here, or very similar conclusions. So yeah. And uh, if the market is opaque, if dealers quote without seeing the entire market order flow, then from their point of view, they are in the standard basic lost in Milgram model. So here we are assuming that uh, each dealer gets one order, so none of them get to see both orders. Again, to make the point, again, you can relax this assumption, again, this will be... This will add layers to analysis, but will not change the conclusions. So each dealer only receives one of the orders. And so from their point of view, it's either coming from informed order or from informed trader or the uninformed trader. And so traders informed with probability pi. And so we will, we will we are able to do the standard gloss and milgram analysis to obtain our ask and bid price prices uh, set by both or all dealers in the market in this case. So if the market is transparent, on the other hand, then all dealers get to see both orders before they um, set the quotes, or they are able to condition their quotes on the total market order flow, which is another assumption that is implicit in this model, which is not necessarily realistic. But if um, Basically, if the dealers cannot condition their prices on orders received by other dealers, then, well, there is no point to transparency in our model, to order flow transparency at the very least. So, both dealers are um, able to condition their quotes on the total order flow, and in this case, they completely infer uh, the trader's type from the uh, order flow. So if both orders are a buy, then this must be an informed trader, so they will set ask price to be VH. If they um, see both, if they see two sell orders, they once again infer that the trader is informed and that uh, the value of the asset is VL. So that is the bid price that they set. If they see that traders are uh, one buy and one sell, then they infer that both traders are uninformed, so they are willing to trade at ex-ante valuation. So that's how um, things work. And what can we infer from this? Just, yeah, once again, to reiterate the point third time around, if you... Um, have less sharp uh, discrimination by correlation, by order flow correlations. So you can have uh, accidental correlations because noise traders accidentally submit the same order, so it's the same order as market, uh, as informed trader. Then you'll just have less drastic version of these conclusions. So your prices will still be more dispersed than in the opaque market, but they will not I covered the full spectrum from VH to VL. So what are the conclusions that we make? Firstly, well, I already told you that prices in the transparent market will be more dispersed. In particular, they are, will also be more correlated with the uh, fu fundamental value V, which means that we have better price discovery in transparent markets. And that is something that you expect on a very intuitive level. So it's great to see that this uh, guess is actually confirmed. On the other hand, transparent markets are better than opaque markets for the uninformed traders. Because here they are identified as being uninformed, and so they get better terms of trade. They do not ha have to pay the adverse selection premium. 
they face zero spread. Uh, while on the converse, informed traders are worse off in transparent markets because they are also more easily identified and uh, they get to pay a wider spread. But we'll talk more about seller identification a bit later on. Uh, the big point here is that order flow transparency is a bit of a substitute to trader identity transparency. So one of the notes, the slight caveat that we can do here is that uh, informed order flow may be endogenously reduce, reduced in transparent markets so that they would better blend in with the uninformed traders. And this model would not capture this because uh, all orders are for one unit of the asset. But you can think of this as a reducing pie. Informed traders are trading less actively. So this analysis would then lose power slightly if pi actually reacts to market structure but not to a great extent so the core idea will still be there so this was um, about three different aspects of pre-trade transparency Although the latter, I guess, was more related to in-trade information. Um, but less so, because it was information about other transactions. Now let us look at what are the effects of revealing post-trade information, at being able to access historical data. And here the main uh, kind of transparency that we will, of course, look at is information about past orders. So how does information about past orders affect I guess I forgot to finish the sentence, but uh, affect market outcomes. There was no hidden wisdom in those words, in those hidden words. The model that we will look at here uh, might hit a little bit of a deja vu note. So it'll be exactly the same, almost exactly the same as the toy model that we just had. But these two orders that we just had will arrive in sequence now instead of simultaneously. So we still have a fundamental value being VH or VL with equal probability. We have two, at least two competitive risk neutral dealers. Uh, we have at least two traders, which is each submit unit market orders. Uh, both are informed with probability pi and uh, with probability one minus pi, both are uninformed in which case one buys, one sells, and the order is random. And here, what we compare is a transparent market in which all dealers observe the first order and an opaque market in which this is not the case. So what if all dealers observe the first order? Then in the second period, uh, Yeah, uh, in the second period from observing the second order, all dealers are uh, able to perfectly identify who the trader is because of these perfect positive and negative correlations in the order flow. So our price in the second period will be VH or VL or MU, depending on which order arrives. Same as uh, we had in a transparent market before. In the first period, all dealers will find themselves in a Gloston Milgram market. So once again, they'll have probability pi and one minus pi of facing an informed order or an uninformed order. So uh, standard uh, Gloston Milgram pricing rule applies. Now let's look at the bake market because it's really curious in here. Let us proceed by backwards induction, meaning we will start from the end and unravel the game to its beginning. So the interesting part here is that dealers will have heterogeneous information. So we'll have one dealer, we'll call him I, um, 
who will know what the first period order was. But there will be just one dealer like this. And uh, let's say without loss of generality that there is just one other dealer, it doesn't matter if there are more than one, who... and this dealer is you, uninformed. The dealer will not know what the first period trade was. And just for technical reasons, we will assume that uh, they, these two dealers move in sequence. So first the uninformed guy sets a quote and then the informed uh, trader sets a quote. Otherwise, the analysis will be a little more difficult. You'll have to look for mixed strategy equilibria and they are probably slightly complicated. So you'll have mixing over an interval of prices. We probably don't want to go in there. Once again, unless you want to do uh, some auctions later in the course, in which case we will look at those mixes over an interval of prices. Okay, so uh, how, what, what happens in this market? What happens in the second period of this market when these dealers move in sequence? So for the uninformed dealer, how can he behave? Uh, let us actually, I think, go back to our blackboard. No? Draw a line. And uh, then let me insert a table here. So we'll look, order one, order two. Nope, not that. The expected value of the asset, conditional on the two orders, I'll call them O1 and O2. Maybe a better way would be to stick with our old notation and to call them D1 and D2, directions of trade 1 and trade 2. And we will look at what the price uh, of the informed dealer is in the second period and what the price of the uninformed dealer in the second period is. So let us suppose without loss of generality that the second order was a buy. So we are looking at S quotes. They are only relevant if the order was a buy. So the analysis is symmetrical for the uh, bid side of the market. We can have two cases, right? So either the first order was a buy or it was a sell. In the first case, what is the expected value of the uh, asset? Well, we know that orders are positively autocorrelated if traders are informed, which means that uh, value is, and since they are both willing to buy, the, tr the asset is worth a lot, meaning that V equals to VH. If, however, in the, we are in the second case in which order flow is uncorrelated or negatively serially correlated, then we get the inference that both of these orders came from the uninformed traders, so we get no new information about V, and our expected value of V coincides with our uh, market price mu. And in all of this, by we, I mean the informed dealer. So the informed dealer will know, will have these expectations regarding V, which means that what are the prices that uh, the dealer would be willing to set? So these are the prices which the dealer sells the asset, which means that he wants to get at least as much as the asset is worth, which means that in the first case he'll get, uh, he will charge at least VH, and it does not make sense to charge more than VH, so we'll say that uh, it's just VH. Basically, there are no numbers in our model that are larger than VH and lower than VL, right? Well, in the second case, he will be willing to charge any price between mu, well, and VH, if VH is the maximal number, is the largest number. But he'll be willing to uh, quote any ask price above mu. And if it's strictly above mu, then he'll trade at a profit. And now let us look at what can the uninformed trader do in this case. Uh, 
possible cases for uh, you. In particular, if the uninformed dealer uh, quotes something less than the H, then what happens? Uh, then he will trade in the first case because the informed dealer uh, quotes VH. So the, the uninformed dealer's quotes is more, is more uh, appealing. So you trade in case one. What happens in case two? So in case two, uh, our uninformed dealer sets some price A to U. But then our assumption about the order of the moves kicks in and we say that the informed dealer will be able to undercut this price by a little bit. Right? So for any basically ask price, let's say that it's also uh, larger than mu. For any ask price larger than mu, the informed dealer will be able to outbid. Uh, to undercut the uninformed dealer, so the uninformed dealer will not get to trade. And not in... I say it does not... The uninformed dealer then will not trade in case 2, because I can undercut by uh, epsilon, by some small amount. And I guess the important note is that it will be definitely profitably for the informed dealer. So the informed dealer will, not, will know that uh, the order flow is coming from the uninformed traders, so he will be willing to trade at any price. He will be always willing to undercut the uninformed dealer, right? Which means that setting this price between mu and vh for the uninformed dealer is never profitable. Because Conditional on trade, uh, the expected value of the asset, okay, never mind, will be just VH. So the uninformed dealer will sell the asset worth VH at some price lower than VH. So this cannot happen in equilibrium. Uh, if a to you is equal to mu, then the analysis is pretty similar, except uh, with some probability uh, the trader will also trade in case 2. But the expected value conditional on trade will still be greater than mu, so the trader will still, the dealer will still trade at a loss. Meaning, oh, sorry, that. Okay, we can do this. Uh, therefore, the uninformed dealer will have to quote VH. This is the only possible case in equilibrium. So going back to the slides, we will have... Um, yes the S price set by the uninformed dealer equal to VH. Therefore, the informed dealer will just quote uh, VH when he knows the uh, order flow is coming from informed traders. And he'll he will just barely undercut the uninformed dealer if the order flow is coming from the uninformed traders. Which means that in this latter case, our informed dealer will get a lot of profits. He knows that the asset is worth mu in this case, and he sells the asset at a price close to VH. So that's a lot of profit. And uh, in general, you see that in period two, the spread will be large. Our quotes will be almost at VH in any case, any quote. So the spread will be really, really wide.
question in chat. If uninformed quotes VH, doesn't he incur a loss on average? Uh, well, I believe not. So let us try to go through the reasoning once again. And let us probably go back to our cases. So if the uninformed quotes VH, what happens? So to fill in the table, we'll have uh, VH here and here, and we'll have the H minus epsilon here. So in case one, order flow is coming from informed traders, V is equal to VH. So uninformed trader may or may not trade. If they do, if he does, uh, he does, he sells an asset that is worth VH at a price equal to VH. So he gets profit of zero. In case two, uh, if the trade flow is coming from uninformed traders, the uninformed guy does not get to trade because he's always undercut by the informed dealer. So we get that in both cases, the uninformed gets a profit of zero. So, yeah, I think, I think he gets profit of zero. Uh, the way it should be in competitive markets. Yeah, recall that um, the, the general idea is that dealers suffer from losses if the spread is too narrow, but they get a profit if the spread is too large. So usually our competition uh, drove spread narrow enough to grant uh, dealers zero profits. But in this case, our spread is very wide, so dealers uh, get profits on average. And uh, in our particular model, informed dealer grabs all of this profit. Which... Sorry, let me look forward a little bit. No. No, okay, yes, yes, this is exactly the point that I wanted to make. Sorry about jumping back and forth. So we've analyzed period two. Now let us unravel back to period one. So what will happen in period one? We just learned that whoever gets the first order will get a profit in the second period, will trade as a profit in the second period, which means that it's really, really good for the traders, uh, for the dealers to attract this order flow to them. They really want to attract order flow because then they can exploit it I exploit future trades uh, and trade at a profit. Basically, attracting order flow gives them informational advantage over other dealers. So in our model, we can actually analyze uh, this and see how all dealers who would be completely symmetric in the first period, how they would bid for attracting order flow. And if you do the motions, you will see that this will actually lower the spread. Again, in competitive markets, all dealers should get zero profit on average. In our case, um, the fact that dealers get positive profit or positive chance of a positive profit in the second period means that they can afford some losses in the first period. So this will lead our spread in the first period to be narrower. And if you compute it, it'll be equal to uh, something like this, to pi minus one times uh, the difference, half difference in values. And you can verify that it's less than, uh, than in the static loss and Milker model. So the thing to note here, I guess, yeah, two things. One thing is we can observe something like this in reality. So one example here uh, that I took from previous person who notes uh, from previous person's notes from pre previous person who told this course. So don't ask me on the reference for this one. But he said that forex dealers are often said to quote negative spread to large traders. In real markets, negative spreads uh, probably can happen, but not really, because if there is a negative spread there is often arbitrage. So arbitrage traders will take um, advantage of negative spreads if these uh, 
quotes are not individualized. So these are, if these are not personal offers, but market offers. But in general, attempts to attract order flow will maybe force dealers to quote narrower spreads to get informational advantage over other dealers. And this can also serve as an alternative explanation of order flow payments that I believe we talked about a little bit uh, last week. And the thing here is that uh, dealers or exchanges quite often pay brokers for sending order flow their way, for sending order flow to these particular dealers or exchanges. The second point here is that uh, opacity once again increases the aggregate trading cost for the uninformed traders, not the dealers. So I guess the hardest part about this model is keeping track of the informed and uninformed traders versus dealers, because we use the same notation. So in opaque markets, they pay double the trading cost. They pay a small spread in the first period, but very large spread in the second period. While in the transparent markets, they pay some spread in the first period, but they pay nothing in the second period because they are identified, excuse me, as being uninformed. Right? So as usual, transparency benefits the uninformed traders. A question that you can ask here is, would dealers like to commit to transparency? Would they like to establish transparency in their own market? And the answer is no. So in oh yeah, sorry. I was, I had a mind glitch at the moment. Uh, mind blanked for a second there. Uh, the idea here is that if I do not disclose my past orders, my past uh, trade information, then I get to enjoy the informational advantage across uh, the rest of the market or over the rest of the market. So I get, I get more information that I can trade upon. Information about my trades gets me uh, some more information about the underlying value of the asset. So the dealers would like to exploit this information to get higher profits from future trades. And they would not like to share this information with other dealers because that would, that is, this information is their competitive advantage. And one implication of this conclusion is that if dealers have a choice between uh, transparent trading venues and less transparent trading venues, they would go to a less transparent uh, exchange or trading platform. And this is, you can see it as a one aspect of competition and one driving force towards opacity uh, in, in financial markets. Moving on, another consequence of uh, post-trade transparency, of historical data being available, so we just argued that this transparency can, uh, well, in some particular way, lead to more fair, I guess, competition among dealers. And it would uh, benefit the uninformed traders. But there is a flip side to that coin. In particular, uh, let us go back to industrial organization once again. You have perfectly competitive markets, you have imperfectly competitive markets. And suppose that there are a few dealers, not too many, so they are not perfectly competitive. They all have a little bit of market power. And given that there are not too many of them, they can actually try to collude to increase their profits. So they can try to coordinate on some wider spread so that all of them get to enjoy high profits. Now, when all traders set very wide spreads, any single, sorry, not traders, dealers, any single dealer has an incentive to deviate from that and offer a narrower spread, slightly narrower spread, slightly undercut his colleagues and still get positive profits, but attract a lot of order flow. So uh, trade more at the same profit per stock equals more profit, right? So in order for this collusion to be sustainable, there should be a threat of punishment 
in case for in case anyone deviates and this is kind of a universal way this works the repeated prisoners dilemma one illustration of how this works is a very recent case of uh, oil market so OPEC is uh, a canonical example of a cartel is a collusive organization of oil producers who decide how much to supply how much oil to supply to the market and uh, in this way to manipulate markets they have some collusive agreement and russia decided to not play by the book and to um, not follow this agreement or to walk out of this agreement so what happened uh, the remaining countries or one country in particular punished the deviator by drastically increasing oil supply and thus decreasing oil prices uh, for everyone but for uh, the deviant in particular so that Russia is not able to actually profit from uh, its deviation but the, yeah the big idea collusion successful collusion requires feasible threat of punishment but in order to be able to punish deviations you need to be able to detect deviations. You need to be able to see who exactly does not follow the agreement. And market transparency improves this ability. So it um, allows firms in the market to actually see who are traded in which terms and to see whether dealers follow, whether other dealers follow the pre-established agreement or not. So in this case, uh, transparency fosters collusion. Transparency helps collusion. And I believe one of the articles that I gave you to read uh, from last week to this week was on exactly that, uh, the Economist article. So maybe I should move it to this lecture instead. Okay, so this was a bit of a side note. And uh, we discussed consequences of post-trade transparency. Now let us also look at the final kind of information, which is the in-trade information, which is uh, pretty much the ability to identify who you are trading with, what is your counterparty. And markets are in general heterogeneous in this respect. For example, if you think of limit order book, it's pretty anonymous. So you see that there is a limit order there in the book. You may you probably do not know who submitted it. You may know some, uh, you may get to observe some trader identifier, uh, but in general, you need not necessarily know who you are trading with. On the other hand, when you are trading with a dealer, these may quite often be uh, relatively personal relationships. Not in that sense but uh, you communicate with dealer personally and you are able to convey some information about who you are if you are trading or uh, who is your client if you are a broker trading on someone's behalf so you can say to the dealer hey I got this huge order from an institutional investor from a pension fund they are not usually informed right so are you willing to give me a price improvement so markets are kind of heterogeneous in whether you get to see or whether you can acquire information on a uh, trader's identity. So if trader's identity is visible, it will obviously affect the prices that uh, this trader is offered. And just as we have been discussing today and in the rest of the course, if traders are uninformed, like once again institutional investors, uh, they will get good price they will get price improvements from dealers they will um, yeah if some limit traders are able to react quickly to a market order which they see comes from an institutional investor they will try to maybe quickly submit limit orders and execute against that market order insiders on the other hand who are known to be usually informed or who have a reputation for informed trading will get bad prices they will get a widespread they will get prices that are unfortunate uh, unfavorable for them 
that will reflect the information that these incisors are likely to possess. So in general, once again, this identity is good for uh, uninformed traders. This transparency is bad for informed traders. Now, if you do not know who exactly you're trading with, but you um, see some identifier of the trader, so some alphanumeric code that was assigned to this particular trader, then in principle, you can th still think that uh, uh, there can be some reputation to be built. If the market coordinates on you know, keeping track of who submitted which kind of orders, uh, then similar reputational mechanisms may come into play. Now, there may be uh, different ways or instruments or channels in which you can signal or dis try to disclose the fact that your trade is uninformative. Like, uh, yeah, you can say that you're trading on behalf of a large institutional investor or they just plain disclose the identity. Or you can use some indirect ways. Like one indirect way is uh, called sunshine trading, where you announce your trade a few days in advance before you actually submit it to the market. So when you actually submit this trade to the market, it is guaranteed to not incorporate any kind of recent information. Um, that's one instrument that you can use. And in general, if these instruments are available to the market, then they will be used. So there will be this kind of unraveling, right? Uninformed traders will not be willing to use them because um, they will get worse terms of trade if they disclose that they're informed. But the uninformed traders will want to use these um, instruments. So the uninformed traders will want to separate from the rest, from the pool of the all other traders, right? Then once the uninformed traders have separated, those traders who are slightly informed, who are the least informed in the remaining pool, will also want to separate because now they will only benefit from separating because the pool of um, traders in general faces uh, worse terms of trade they will benefit from separation. And there will be this kind of unraveling in the market. A similar kind of outcome may happen due to cream skimming practices. And once again, we have talked a little bit about those last week. Uh, some large dealer brokers, like large banks, can execute some trades in their own dark pools. So to match their clients with their other clients or to match against or to trade against banks own uh, account instead of forwarding their clients deal to the market. And so, of course, large banks know everything about their clients or they know a lot about their clients. So they can uh, forward the uninformed trades to their own dark pools and they can forward the informed trades coming from informed traders to the market. So they would pick off profitable trades and forward the rest. This would lead to the same kind of separation, right? If everyone in the market knows that only the uh, only trades from informed traders are actually forwarded to the market, then the market will adjust, uh, will account for this piece of information appropriately. So transparency is kind of... Uh, Transparency regarding seller trader identity is uh, self-enforcing in a sense. It is, you can say, a natural equilibrium in some sense. So in, in what we just saw uh, regarding trader identity, this kind of transparency, uh, entry transparency, leads to reallocation of wealth, of wealth and welfare from insiders to the uninformed. So insiders suffer from transparency, while the uninformed actually benefit from it, right? They get better terms of trade. 
This may help you explain a few of the regularities in the real world. For example, regulators quite often care about the uninformed traders, because they do not have enough influence on the market, on the market setup, on market rules. So that's why regulators push for transparency. They are trying to protect the uninformed traders. And the market, in turn, uh, resists this. The market pushes for more opaque um, e uh, equilibrium, more opaque conditions, because insiders probably have more influence on market organization than the uninformed traders. Now, um, the usual caveat applies. You can think that uh, since transparency harms the informed traders, it will discourage them from trading, so it will reduce informed trading, and this in turn will reduce price discovery. But that is kind of the usual argument, so I will not stop on it. One other argument that you can make regarding uh, trader identity, trader information, is that um, in general in economics, you can think of some transactions, mostly they fall under the term insurance. And these transactions are better off if they are, um, if they are executed before the information is revealed. So when all parties are symmetrically uninformed. Like health insurance, if you are a risk-averse person, you are better off just paying a little bit in health insurance uh, over the course of your lifetime than to have no health insurance and pay a huge amount in case you actually fall sick and have to pay a lot of medical expenses. So in that case, it is n not beneficial for you to know whether you are healthy or not. You want to insure before you know that. And you might think that if traders in general are risk averse a little bit, then a similar kind of uh, reasoning can apply. Then the loss that the informed traders suffer from, incur, uh, hits them more significantly than the gain, than the benefit of uh, the uninformed traders. But it's, it's, it's really not that clear uh, to, to which extent this argument applies to financial markets in particular. Once again, it's mostly about insurance. Okay, so that's, that's mostly it for today. And perfect timing for that one. Uh, the main lesson that we learned today is that transparency mostly has uh, reallocative consequences. It typically benefits the... Um, uninformed traders, so you can think that they are the ones that generally provide or foster liquidity in the market, so transparency may help liquidity in the market. Insiders typically lose from transparency, from being identified as insiders, so transparency may lead to worse price discovery. And dealers in general may win or lose. They typically, I guess, lose in most of what we saw. So they also push for more opaque markets. And the latter two largely explain why most markets are not perfectly transparent, while the first observation tells you why a lot of legislation is directed towards making markets more transparent. So there are obviously some upsides in general. So transparency does not just reallocate wealth across uh, society, but it may also generate or destroy some um, wealth, welfare. It may improve some efficiency. In general, we think that the more information there is, the better decisions we can make. So transparency may increase this allocative efficiency, how efficiently assets are allocated in the society. But it may impede uh, risk sharing in the society and it may have some adverse effects when it's asymmetrically distributed, when it leads to more asymmetric knowledge, asymmetric information in the society than there was in the beginning. And one point that uh, I think, yes, that I did not 
cover until now, is that opaqueness can be good in limit books. So one way, um, one thing that is, one instrument that exists in limit order books is that you can submit hidden orders that are executed against, but that are not explicitly visible to other traders in the market. And these limit orders, uh, hidden limit orders, may be used by uninformed traders as a kind of insurance. So if I have a, a long position in some stock, I may submit a limit sell order on that stock. So in case the market price goes down, I will get to sell my stock before it falls too, uh, too low. And in, the sen in that sense, I will have a, a stop loss. So this is basically a free option, a free, yes, a free call option that I issue to the market, or I guess a free put option that I buy. No, I guess it's, it's a call option that I issue. That's more, more correct. And so why, why, why do we need these limit orders to be hidden? Why do we like them to be hidden? Because if I submit this, insurance limit order as a hidden order, it will not affect the market price by itself. But if I submit a large limit order to sell and it's visible to other traders in the market, then my desire to sell might in itself move the market price and will kind of uh, lead to the loss that I'm actually trying to avoid. It will lead to my stock being depreciated. Uh, in that sense, I do want to submit some orders, some limit orders without uh, moving the market price. And in that case, this dimension of opaqueness can be beneficial for the society, for uh, the traders in general. So that's it for today. Uh, here's one exercise for you to do at home in your quarantines. And I have also posted an article on Epsilon for you to read. So thank you for sticking around. If there are any questions, as usual, I will uh, stick around. But otherwise, that's it for today. I will see you next Wednesday when we will talk about value of liquidity. And I can't help but run the uh, cutscene again. Let's see it.